Please would you welcome Seamus Stackpole. Thank you very much, uh, Jessamyn. Um, folks, you can call me Professor Seamus Stackpool. I'm not actually a professor, but I'd really love it if you did. Um, no, I'm here to, to talk to you about an incident. It happened on the Nace Road one time after a dance. There was a, a Polish fella named Jan Zimek, and he fancied this girl named Teresa Burchell. And uh, he'd been at dance, he danced with her, they had a lovely time. After the dance, her and her friend and her um, friend's brother were cycling home and Jan was like, I fancy you, I'd like a kiss. But there was also a German fella named Hun cycling after her as well and she said, lads, you're being foolish, you're being drunk, just go on home. So a little while down the road, Jan Zimek and this fella Hund got into a fight. Jan suffered a fractured skull, he had to be sent home. And the interesting thing about this is that it happened in the early 1940s. And Jan Zimek was actually a free Polish pilot and Oberhauser Hund was a German Nazi Luftwaffe pilot. Now you might ask, what in hell's name are two World War II pilots doing in Nace in the middle of the 1940s? The fact was that during the 1940s, we didn't give it the title of World War II as was appropriate. We called it the emergency because we like to downplay things. <laughs> Stop making a fuss. But what would happen is, during World War II, any belligerent pilot that happened to alight on our sovereign soil was packed up and sent to the Curra to a place called the K-Lines Camp. Uh, this is a policy dreamed up by our fantastic statesman Eamon de Valera, who was pretty much king of this country during the 20th century. He was basically, <laughs> I'll be president for a while, I'll be Taoiseach for a while. And at the time, he was both Taoiseach and the Minister for External Affairs. Now, as you know, Ireland was a neutral country at the time. We couldn't be seen to be favouring either nation. So we did have to institute this policy of internment. So we did set up the Curra Camp, the K-Lines Camp. There was two camps inside the K-Lines Camp. There was the B Camp, which not only held the British, but it held uh, French, it held Polish, it held Americans and Canadians and it had the best stocked bar in Europe at the time. <laughs> because of the policy of internment, the French ambassador, the Canadian High Commissioner, the British representative, the Polish representative, arrived to the bar each week with a truck full of vodka, scotch, <laughs> cognac, brandy. The officers even got to drink Guinness for free. So there was actually a letter sent home by the commandant of the camp saying, your officers are not comporting themselves as gentlemen during their time here at the Curra. <laughs> they were lads with sore heads. But um, the, t the funny thing is, there was just a corrugated fence separating the British from the Germans. And of course, because they weren't prisoners of war, they were just termed what was euphemistically uh, termed as guests of the state. <laughs> guests surrounded by 20 foot tall barbed wire fences surrounded by a corridor of grass where there was a man walking around with a rifle at all times. That's the sort of guest where you don't give them a five-star review on Yelp afterwards. <laughs> um, but at the time, the internees were allowed to listen to the radio. They were allowed to listen to the wireless. So if the Germans heard that uh, London had been bombed in the Blitz, a cheer would go up from the German side. And if they heard that uh, the Allies were successful in Anzio, a cheer went up from the British side. So there was a little bit of antagonism going on between the two sides. But as I mentioned at the start, the Polish pilot and German pilot were at the same dance. And you're wondering, why on earth were the two pilots allowed out of the camp and allowed to go to the dance? That's because there was a very simple piece of paper, a parole slip, which said, I, on my honour as an officer and a gentleman, do hereby swear to be back in the camp by such and such an hour. <laughs> Signed and dated. Not only did they take this so seriously, but there was one American pilot. Before America's official entry into the war, there was a man named Bud Wolf, a big, blustery, blonde, adventurous man who joined the RAF because he just wanted to, you know, go out, see the world and shoot Nazis. So he joined the RAF, he crash landed in Ireland, and the first thing he said when he got to the camp was, how are we going to escape? And they said, 
well, there's a free bar and uh, <laughs> we're not getting shot at. So Bud, Bud being the adventurous idiot that he was, signed a parole slip one day, got on a bus and went to Belfast. He went into the first police station he found in Belfast and he said, this is Flight Lieutenant Bud Wolf reporting for duty. He's like, you escaped from the K-Lines camp. He's like, well, actually, I just sort of, I went up here while I was on parole. And they said, you, you broke, you broke your, your, your conditions of parole. Straight away, they put Bud into the back of a car and drove him back from Belfast <laughs> to the K-Lines camp. I said, sorry, Bud is a bit of a prick. So Bud learned the hard way <laughs> that your honor as an officer and a gentleman is taken very, very seriously. So Bud spent the rest of his time in the camp. But um, like the interesting thing was, they were allowed out. Some of the Germans actually studied engineering and design here in Dublin. Some of them didn't want to go home after the war. A uh, good reason for that being that their part of home was occupied by the Soviet Union after the war. <laughs> I don't think I'd want to go back to that either. <laughs> but it was, it was an interesting time because, you see, we had a problem with people flying over our country and then crashing because the planes at the time were basically kites with lawnmower engines in them. <laughs> and the instruments, there was no computers, there was no GPS. It was mostly analog computers, things like that, or just a compass which could become demagnetized, or you could just get blown off course. So the Irish solution to this was, at 83 locations around the country, in 60-foot letters, writing the name ERA <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> Literally, pilots would have to look down and say, wrong country, <laughs> and turn around. Uh, not all of them got to turn around. There was uh, a case of uh, Canadian pilots crash-landed in uh, North County Clare. Um, walking around, taking in the sights, they came across a child who said, oh, mammy, look at the man. And then the mother reported them to the local authorities. So the, um, the local defense forces took them into custody. And by taking them into custody, they actually went on a pub crawl around the County Clare. <laughs> the reason for this is they had to wait for the actual army to send a car from the barracks in Limerick. And while they were over the airmen, they could actually bill it as an expense <laughs> for going to the bar. That was enterprising, folks, if you ask me. <laughs> but um, there, was a, there was a real sort of a strange, there, there was a strange attitude towards it at the time because, you see, the Irish had to intern the British and the Germans, even though they could see towards the end of the war that the Germans were not going to win. And the British could have pressed the Irish to release the British airmen. But the British realized if they released the British airmen, they'd have to release an equal number of German airmen. And if they released, you know, very highly trained bomber crews and fighter pilots, those men would go back to Germany and be back in the air. So the British troops were doing more to save British lives by being held in the Curragh camp than actually flying their Spitfires and Lancasters, which is a little bit strange. Um, but it wasn't just that the policy of internment meant that Irish men, um, sorry, that the pilots were interned, but it also meant that because we were neutral, we were a safe haven um, for physicists like Irvin Schrodinger, uh, which a lot of you might be interested in. Irvin Schrodinger actually lived in, in Dublin during World War II. Um, G2, which was the Irish special branch over intelligence, kept tabs on him during World War II to see was he up to no good. And he wasn't up to any good at all because the fact was he was actually having an affair with pretty much half of his students. <laughs> uh, it wasn't so much a case of uh, Schrodinger's cat, it was Schrodinger's affair. Because if he was behind a closed door, you didn't know whether he was by himself or shagging one of his undergrads. <laughs> Uh, but he wasn't spying, but there was actually a German spy, a man named Werner Unland. He was a German who came to Ireland before World War II. He set himself up in the import-export business. 
Um, and he was sending off fantastic reports back to Germany. He was saying that he had been up to Belfast, he'd observed the shipbuilding and everything like that. He was sending expenses back to them and everything. And they were saying, Werner, you know what? You are doing fantastic work. You are doing brilliant work. We're going to send another spy over to help you. He said, no, 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 don't do that. The fact was, Werner wasn't actually leaving his flat. Yeah. Werner was sitting at home, <laughs> having the life of Riley, and not actually going to Belfast at all. He was only pretending to spy. The G2 knew all about this. They liaised with MI5 and MI6 in England and said, will we apprehend Werner? And they said, uh, actually, he's doing more harm to German espionage <laughs> by reporting back. So you know what, we'll leave him at it. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't just Germans involved in espionage, there was one Irishman, uh, I think his name was Sean Walsh. He had been uh, an Irishman who enlisted in the British Army. On their way back to Dunkirk, he got separated. Um, he was not a spy, he was just a foot soldier. He got separated, he was taken in by the French. The French were like, you have come here to save us, we want to help you. He wasn't the nicest guy, so one day he got drunk and he started robbing the French couple who were harboring him. So he was reported to the local police, who at that time were the Germans. <laughs> now the Germans took a very dim view of espionage and they were going to sentence him to death. So they wrote to Ireland saying, we have your man here, he's obviously a spy, we're going to execute him. And the Irish wrote a very moving letter which um, saved him from being executed, where they said, um, Sean Walsh has neither the literacy nor the guile for espionage. <laughs> So it was the fact that he was insulted that actually saved his life. Um, but just getting back to the, um, the airmen. Obviously, Pearl Harbor happened. The Americans came on in the side of the Allies. By the end of the war, any Allied aircraft that came down in Ireland, it was deemed as a non-operational fight. Even if it was full of bombs and ammo, it was a non-operational fight. And they were just secreted up to Belfast. And it was, you know, a happy ending. Everybody got to go home. The Nazis lost. That's important. <laughs> but while the camp was in its heyday, and while the men were still able to escape if they actually escaped, they couldn't escape on parole, but if they actually broke through the fence, they could escape, the Irish couldn't actually shoot them. They weren't allowed to shoot them. So what they did is they walked around with rifles that weren't loaded. And to make them think they were loaded, one morning they found a dead sheep on the curra. They dragged it outside the camp at 6 o'clock in the morning and poured red ink over it and fired a shot into the air. And when the uh, soldiers came out to see it, it was like, good job shooting that sheep. Could have been an escaping prisoner. <laughs> uh, not only that, some British actually did escape. One time when men were coming back from parole, they actually assaulted the guards, kept them prisoner in the hut. And while they were prisoner in the hut, nine uh, internees escaped. Two of them wrote letters back apologizing for escaping. <laughs> uh, which I think goes to show it was a very, very different time in history. Folks, you know what? You have been a lovely audience and thank you for listening.